special plenary session. Uh, some of you may realize that it is the culmination of a mini conference that has had some excellent papers that all touch on the issue we're going to discuss this afternoon. But we thought this particular part of the, uh, the series was sufficiently timely and had a broad enough interest that, that it would be a, a good thing to discuss in a broader context. Uh, we're going to be looking at developments to make financial markets more reliable. And it, it happens that these issues are being, I won't say resolved, because I think that's overly optimistic, but they're certainly being discussed even as we speak. Um, there was a press release on Friday from <coughs> the uh, head of the Financial Stability Board, Mark Kearney, that announced that uh, the Brisbane Summit, which is uh, happening just now, was in fact going to work toward ending too big to fail. Um, and they were going to do that by putting in place uh, a regulation for uh, having enough loss-absorbing capacity sub debt, some people require it, uh, could be bail in debt. We don't really know the details yet. And they're also going to put in place a protocol for recognizing the, resol the resolution um, uh, proceedings in various countries, which is the other really big issue that we'll be talking about today. Uh, but it is something that, uh, as I say, I don't think we're going to resolve, but there has been an official announcement that progress will be made at this particular meeting. So it really is uh, as timely as, as at least Friday's headlines. Um, we're going to be talking this afternoon about uh, firms that are often called too big to fail. But I wanted to start by pointing out that that's really a misleading term. Um, the FSB, the Financial Stability Board that Mark Carney heads, uh, has formed a list of and let me use another acronym that's maybe a little more exact, but uh, unfortunately one of the prices of entry to this discussion is a lot of acronyms, a GSIB, which is a global, um, international, system, uh, systemically important bank. Now, you could get into GSIFIs, but I think we won't because the, the GSIBs are uh, complicated enough. Uh, and it turns out the FSB forms a list of these and has done so each November, uh, it's updated. The most recent list, which will be updated again in probably about six weeks, has 29 firms listed as GSIBs, and eight of those are headquartered in the United States. Um, so it is um, a fairly significant list of, of firms that I think in general you would all recognize simply by their names. But the important point to note, I think, is that size is neither a necessary nor sufficient um, condition to be on the list. Um, although size is highly correlated with other aspects, but other aspects would include having lots and lots of counterparties in multiple uh, transactions that are all short-term in nature. And that means that if you're going to resolve such an entity, you've really got to do it very, very quickly, um, or you're going to be disrupting not only the operations of that firm, which may be central to the financial infrastructure, but also its counterparties and uh, potentially uh, many, many different uh, countries. Um, the other key issue is that these firms tend to have a global scope and a complex subsidiary structure um, that crosses boundaries in multiple ways. Um, and that means that uh, in order to resolve such an institution, you're going to have to have an agreement among regulators or potentially multiple regulators, as in the United States, <clears throat> and regulators in numerous other countries, possibly 89 or 90, about <clears throat> honoring each other's decisions with regard to resolution. Huge, huge problem. It's orders of magnitude more difficult than figuring out how you do it simply within a uh, domestic economy, and that isn't particularly easy. Um, the um, uh, upshot is that, that we have a lot to talk about today, and uh, because I had absolutely nothing to do with drawing together the panel, let me start by saying that uh, the organizers, Christine Cohen and, and Joe Hughes, have done just a wonderful job of uh, giving me a, a first-rate panel that's really the A-team. Um, we're going to begin with, uh, ah, and here is, <laughs> 
uh, the other astute member just in time. Uh, we're going to begin with Nicola Cetarelli, um, and I will preempt him by saying that he's going to talk from a personal capacity, which has nothing to do with what the Federal Reserve Bank of New York may or may not think about anything. In fact, it may not even be what Nicola thinks about something, but, <laughs> but <clears throat> we'll hold him harmless. Um, Nicola is, uh, has the interesting distinction of having been one of the few people in the regulatory world who's really studied complexity uh, empirically about as deeply as you can. Uh, and so he's familiar with all of the data shortcomings, but he also knows what they say and, importantly, what they don't say. So I've asked him to begin uh, with kind of an overview of the dimensions of complex complexity. Sir Paul Tucker um, is currently uh, an academic, which is uh, good news for the academic world. Uh, I think for, what was it, 30 years before, um, he served a variety of positions in the Bank of England. Uh, I think he, in the end, managed virtually every area in which the Bank of England had um, a role to play. Um, he was deputy governor, uh, but for our purposes, more importantly, he was one of the key people in putting together the new international framework and thinking about resolution policy. Um, he was really, I think, as much as anyone, the person, the architect of the whole financial stability board approach to cross-border resolution policies. And these issues, obviously, are still ongoing. Um, Jim Wigand um, is, uh, I guess, the person who may not be in the program because he graciously agreed to uh, substitute for Art Merton, who had planned to be here. Uh, but Jim is, uh, was the logical person to ask in any event because he spent several decades at the FDIC, again, in a variety of positions, so he's certainly gotten his hands dirty with actual resolutions. But he headed a group over the last, what was it, five or six years? Um, that was focused on how to resolve these very large, very complex financial institutions. And his group, I think, put together probably the first proposal, but certainly has shepherded uh, one of the most complete proposals for how you would negotiate a single point of entry, which has become uh, one of the key uh, uh, strategies that everyone is, is thinking about these days. Then last but certainly not least is Mark Flannery. Um, Several decades ago, I was lucky enough to count uh, Mark as a colleague at Wharton, and even then he was focused on uh, issues of market discipline and liability structures of financial institutions. Um, and I think he's probably, he probably doesn't want to be noticed in this way, but you could argue that he was one of the first authors of a COCO proposal. Uh, and for those who aren't into the literature, that's not a serial. Uh, it's uh, a contingent <laughs> capital instrument. Um, he's been a very, very productive scholar and uh, a frequent visitor at the regulatory agencies, particularly the FDIC and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Uh, and for the last three weeks, um, we can call him chief economist of the SEC. Although I think, uh, I'll preempt his disclaimer, he will not be speaking in that capacity today. Okay, the ground rules are that we're going to have uh, 15 minutes allocated to each of the speakers um, for uh, an initial intervention. Then in the remaining hour, we're going to have a, a broader discussion. Uh, those of you who want to pose questions, I hope that you will. Uh, we may have discussions, and I would guess some disagreements across the panel, uh, but the idea is to try to uh, give as broad uh, a, a consideration of these topics as we possibly can. And uh, I think, uh, as we all recognized, Mark's point about uh, having enough bail-inable debt or, um, is, is actually really under debate right now, and the Fed is at the moment, I think, considering what they're going to propose in the U.S., but in a way waiting until there's some kind of agreement with the rest of the world, which is happening. Also, we might note that in terms of Jim's uh, point about planning, there were war games underway, as I understand it, yesterday, uh, where the very senior people who would be involved were actually trying to um, game the strategy that, that they would follow. Um, but I think the one thing we've left out in this discussion, because we've had a very good uh, and I think a wonderful uh, explanation of the single point of entry strategy, is the banks that Paul mentioned that don't have a holding company structure, that don't really have this obvious target on top. Paul, would you mind saying just a few words about that and then we'll open the discussion up more uh, There are such banks, particularly in Europe. It's a nice accident of US history that for really bad reasons, um, most significant financial companies have holding companies. That's a, 
um, one of those fortuitous things. Um, my hope is that in Europe, the regulators will make um, Barclays, Deutsche, Deutsche um, establish holding companies. I think it's very striking that UBS have announced that they will do so. Axel Weber, the chairman, um, is taking that route precisely for the reasons that we've been describing. I, I worry, I should have included BMP in my list as well, um, I worry that a number of them will want to argue that restructuring and moving their bonds up to the holding company will be expensive. The regulators just have to say, well, expensive for whom? It will be expensive for society for you not to um, do it. Um, that kind of shades into issues that um, were being raised at the, at the end about supervisors, and I hope we can get back to, to those. Good. I, thank you very much. That's um, a, a nice brief explanation of what I think is a very significant problem, particularly because the supervisory authorities are maintaining that both, both of these resolution processes can work, which introduces another uncertainty that markets have to contend with in trying to figure out what the real end game is. And it's very hard for them to price <clears throat> particular liabilities if they really don't know what resolution process will be applied.